Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm particularly excited about today's Grand Rounds as we'll be talking about uh, bench to bite to bedside and uh, something that really reflects the uh, extraordinary breadth of this department uh, from uh, foundational science all the way to uh, to bedside, but uh, with a really important step in the middle these days, which is how do we use data in, uh, in new ways. And we've got uh, two uh, really remarkable leaders in that area to help us think that through with a particular focus today on autoimmunity and in rheumatologic diseases, but you'll see I think it has much broader implications and applications to the way we approach all sorts of disease states. So um, just uh, as you know, Q&A, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box, and my colleague Lexmi, Lexmi Santosh is uh, reviewing those and will uh, pitch some of those to me at the end. Closed captioning is available, and if you're interested in CME, stay on at the very end, and there will be instructions as to how to get it. So the title of the talk uh, today is Improving the Care of Patients with Rheumatologic Diseases from Bench to Bites to Bedside. Uh, we have two speakers to reflect the breadth of that ambitious title, uh, and the first is Judy Ashuri Sinha. Uh, Judy uh, got her MD here at UCSF, residency at Stanford, and then recruited to UCSF for her Rheumatology Fellowship and Physician Scientist Training Program. Uh, and then has stayed on in our faculty and has launched her own lab. Uh, she works as both a rheumatologist and an immunologist to investigate how aberrant immune cell signaling disrupts immune tolerance and can result in autoimmune disease. And that's relevant, obviously, to rheumatology, but uh, really a broader set of uh, diseases where our body chooses to attack us, which is not good. And Judy's trying to get at the uh, at how that happens and why that happens so that we can prevent that from happening. So Judy, thank you for being with us today. And she will be joined by Jimmy Yi. Uh, Jimmy is also a member of our department and lives in the Division of Rheumatology. He's a PhD uh, who graduated uh, from UC Berkeley in, uh, and, uh, in electrical engineering, computer science, and bioengineering. Um, did a short stint at Apple and then uh, finished his PhD in bioinformatics and system biology at UCSD, uh, working on statistical methods for analysis of very large uh, genomic data sets. After his PhD, uh, he did a postdoc at the Broad Institute in, uh, in Boston, and then we were lucky enough to recruit him to UCSF in 2015, where he's focused on single cell and computational genomics to characterize the model of the molecular basis of human phenotypic variation. Uh, his appointments not only are in our department, in the Division of Rheumatology, but also the Institute for Human Genetics, uh, the Baker Institute for Computational Health Sciences, ImmunoX, and the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. He probably has a business card that's about two feet by three feet. Uh, but actually, the breadth of his affiliations really speaks to his importance as a, a key leader in all of these areas and the amount of matrix and overlap between what he does and what a lot of folks do. Jimmy's particular lab focuses on novel experimental approaches that enable large-scale collection of functional genomic data uh, to study the way immune, uh, human immune cells work in both health and in disease. So really critical role, and Jimmy has really emerged as a national leader in this, in this area. So thrilled to have both of you uh, with us today. And the structure here is Judy's going to start uh, with a, a talk in her area. Jimmy will come on and do the same, and we will hopefully spend the next last uh, 10 or 12 minutes uh, in discussion. So Judy, let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you about an animal model of autoimmune disease and how we can phenotype uh, T cells to understand their contribution to uh, autoimmunity. And so rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that targets joints, but it also targets other organs and is thought to be driven by CD4 T cells. Now this is largely supported by genetic studies. In fact, the strongest genetic association is with the MHC class two molecule HLA-DR4, which supports a role for antigen presentation in disease. And so this begs the question, are antigen activated T cells, meaning they're activated through their T cell receptor, are these involved in disease pathogenesis? And if so, how do we go about identifying these T cells to investigate their functional contribution to disease? And with that, we set out to, to do just that, identify antigen activated T cells before and during uh, disease development with the uh, long-term goal of identifying inciting antigens in human disease. 
So in order to do this, we had developed a model to identify uh, antigen activated T cell responses using a specific and sensitive marker of strength of T cell receptor or T cell antigen receptor signaling called NER77, also known as NER, uh, NR4A1. So NER77 is an orphan nuclear hormone receptor, which means it doesn't have any known endogenous ligand. It's also an immediate early gene that is rapidly upregulated after antigen receptor signaling. However, it's insensitive to cytokine signaling, meaning that inflammatory uh, stimuli don't induce the expression of this marker. Unlike some more commonly active, used activation markers, such as CD69 on T cells, so what we found is that a subset of CD4 T cells infiltrating rheumatoid arthritis synovial tissue from human samples upregulate NER77. So what does this mean? This indicates to us that a subset of these T cells are indeed experiencing antigen encounter and responding to intraarticular antigen in the RA uh, joint. And so to understand their functional significance, we turn to an animal model of autoimmune arthritis called the SKG mouse. Now the SKG mouse has a point mutation in ZAP70. ZAP70 is a tyrosine kinase that's critical for T cell signaling uh, to occur. And due to this mutation, ZAP70 can no longer bind to the, one of the chains of the TCR, of the T cell receptor. And so this leads to severe impairment in T cell receptor signaling transduction. Now these mice um, uh, then have altered thymic selection. Strength of T cell receptor signaling is really important to select just the right T cells to get out into the periphery. So in the SKG mouse model, instead of deleting self-reactive T cells through negative selection, these T cells then get selected and make it out into the periphery. Now these arthritogenic T cells are actually dormant and require an immune stimulus in order to become activated such as colonization with uh, a fungus in their lungs or microbiota in their gut. You can also synchronize development of arthritis in the spontaneous autoimmune disease model by injecting them with zymazan, a fungal cell wall component. Both of these ways, either from colonization with microbiota, particular microbiota, or with uh, immunization, um, it activates the antigen presenting cells uh, to then co-stimulate T cells. They also release IL-6, which is an inf can be used, seen as an inflammatory protein by these T cells and is critical for arthritis development in this model and differentiation of Th17 cells, which is part of the disease process in these mice. These T cells then upregulate certain markers such as CCR6, which allows the cells to hone to the joint and cause a destructive arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. Interestingly, these mice also developed uh, RA-related autoantibodies, such as rheumatoid factor, CCP antibody. They even can develop a pneumonitis that looks a lot like interstitial lung disease, such as what we see in rheumatoid arthritis. So there are a few unanswered questions in this model that we set out to answer. For example, how do SKG CD4 T cells paradoxically differentiate into pathogenic effector cells despite their mutation in ZAP70 and their poor TCR signaling. Um, also, how does their T cell repertoire contribute to the activation of these T cells in the periphery? So we hypothesized that we could use NER77 to identify self-reactive CD4 T cell subsets in the SKG mouse. We back-crossed a NER77 reporter onto the SKG mice, which we term SKG NER. So in this model, green fluorescent protein is under control of the NER77 reporter. So we use it as a surrogate readout for NER77 upregulation. And what we find, here's the uh, histogram from a, a flow cytometry plot. We find that after synchronizing arthritis and arthritis induction in SKG mice, and we look at T cells infiltrating joint draining lymph nodes, we find that there's an upregulation of NER77 GFP in the entire CD4 T cell repertoire uh, compared to non-arthritic mice as depicted in this gray histogram. We also see a further upregulation of NER77 GFP in the CD4 T cells infiltrating the arthritic joint of the SKG mice. 
Now, we didn't see a discrete positive population as we initially anticipated. Well, we know that CD4 T cells are sufficient and necessary to cause arthritis in this model, but we don't know which ones. Is the entire repertoire autoreactive or only a subset? So since GFP levels reflect strength of TCR signaling, so T cells that see the most antigen encounter in the periphery have the highest levels of NER77 GFP, we asked whether T cells at each end of the distribution curve can have distinct um, arthritogenic potential. And so to investigate the functional differences of these subsets of T cells, we took advantage of an adoptive transfer model where the CD4 T cells taken from SKG mice and adoptively transferred into lymphopenic hosts are sufficient to cause and transmit arthritis. That also looks like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And so we sorted out naive T cells depleted of T regulatory marker CD25 and sorted them based on their GFP expressions. And then we adoptively transferred these into skid mice, lymphopenic mice, and assessed arthritis two weeks later by histology. And not surprisingly, as expected, recipients that received T cells from wild type mice did not develop arthritis. To orient you to these histology slides, we see here this white space is the joint space between these two bones. And the black arrow is uh, pointing to the synovial lining, which is only a single cell layer thick in uh, mouse joints. This purple area here is the cartilage staining and this more pinkish area is the bone. And so the recipients that received GFP high cells from SKG mice clearly had damage done to their joints. And so we see complete loss of the joint space. We see proliferation of the synovial tissue. We also see uh, loss of the architecture of the cartilage and on this side, we see complete destruction and erosion into the joint. And this is just after two weeks. And so from these studies, we concluded that NER77 GFP levels can indeed be used to enrich for a more arthritogenic SKG T cells. Uh, and so to summarize some of our earlier work, we found that due to the point mutation in ZAP70, SKG T cells do not signal well. And because of this, they have a more autoreactive repertoire that escapes uh, from the thymus. These T cells encounter more endogenous antigen and we can identify them by the level of NER77 GFP that they express. We had also found in a series of experiments that these cells are actually more sensitive to the uh, IL-6 cytokine signaling, which makes them more readily, readily differentiate into pathogenic Th17 cells. In part, we found that this was due to lower levels of SOX3, which is a critical negative regulator of IL-6. So in summary, we had found that these cells were more self-reactive in an autologous mixed lymphocyte reaction. We found that these cells in vivo and in vitro more readily produce IL-17 and that they were more arthritogenic. So next we wanted to study the evolution of arthritis-related autoimmunity before the onset of inflammatory arthritis in order to provide new insights into early autoimmune disease pathogenesis. We hypothesized that CD4 SKG T cells might exhibit dysregulated expression of a broader program of immune regulators leading ultimately to a breach in peripheral tolerance and resultant arthritis. And so we performed both bulk and uh, single cell sequencing. And here I'll share, share our single cell sequencing results and they both validated uh, and refined our bulk results. And we performed this in collaboration with Jimmy Yi, as well as a talented MSTP student in his lab, Elizabeth McCarthy. We sorted uh, T cells from SKG and wild type mice. Again, we sorted out the naive T cells before arthritis development and gated on their GFP high levels or GFP low, and then perform paired RNA and TCR sequencing to study their transcriptome. And what we found was um, quite a bit of heterogeneity in the naive T cells. So to orient you here, this is a UMAP uh, distribution, which is similar to a TISNI plot. And um, with the UMAP, it's taking high dimensional data and putting it into a two dimensional space and each dot represents an individual cell. And these cells um, that are clustered together 
have more similar uh, transcriptomes to each other. And interestingly, we found that this red cluster here has the highest levels of NER77, also known as NR4A1. And so this NER77 high cluster, um, we asked, you know, are all the GFP high cells uh, that we sorted sitting in this cluster? And so what we found when we take a look at the different subgroups is that the GFP high T cells actually occupied all the different clusters that were identified. However, in this NER77 high cluster, most of the cells come from the GFP high population compared to the GFP low. So we asked what other genes are being expressed along with NER77 that are driving this, um, unique, these, this unique cluster. And what we found was that when we compared this cluster to all the other cells, that they upregulated uh, T cell receptor signaling response genes, meaning that after TCR signaling, all these genes get induced, uh, including immediate early genes such, such as in the EGR family, as well as negative regulators of TCR signaling like LAG3, PD1, uh, PDL2. And then we asked whether there was a difference in the top differentially expressed genes between the different subgroups of cells occupying this cluster. And what we found was that the highest levels of these genes are really expressed in the GFP high subgroups. So then we performed gene set enrichment analysis. And what we found was that this TCR signaling signature was further enriched in the SKG GFP high cells compared to the wild type. Now this is despite their mutation in ZAP70 leading to impaired proximal TCR signaling. So we took this to mean this is really reflective of a chronic endogenous encounter due to their self-reactive repertoire. So next we performed, uh, TC we uh, examined our TCR sequencing results to take a look at this repertoire. And what we found, we didn't find any oligoclonality, which we weren't expecting because we're looking at naive T cells. It's not in the setting of disease. And what we found was an, a skewed um, repertoire of the V beta uh, gene that uh, is one of the components of the T cell receptor that recognizes antigen. And so we see that these V betas are uniquely enriched in the SKG high population compared to the wild type. To orient you to this graph, all the dots to the right of this dotted line are enriched in the SKG high population compared to the wild type high. And now the dark blue dots are significantly enriched in the SKG high population compared to the SKG low. And so this is also represented here to the right in a bar plot. And we see these particular TRBVs that are significantly enriched um, uniquely in the SKG high population compared to the other uh, groups that we looked at. When we took a look at the V-alpha, the other component of the antigen recognition, part of the T cell receptor, we did not see any skewing or particular enrichment of one of the TCR V-alpha genes. So first for us, this confirmed that um, negative selection was effective in SKG mice, particularly in the SKG GFP high T cells. But we also recognize that these V betas were not just random V betas, but ones that are known by um, mouse T cell immunologists to respond to endogenous mouse viral super antigen. So these, this left us with a provocative hypothesis is V beta being driven by involvement of super antigen. Now, super antigens can polyclonally activate T cells. And the way they do this is instead of a binding to the antigen binding group, they actually bind to the outside of the NHC molecule and to the V beta chain. So they can um, simultaneously activate a large number of T cells at the same time. And perhaps in medicine, one of the best examples or, uh, that we think about is in the setting of toxic shock syndrome, which is driven by a super antigen from staphylococcus and activates many T cells at the same time, uh, resulting in a cytokine storm and making patients very sick. Well, viruses can also produce super antigen. And in our mouse, um, in mice, uh, many of them have mouse mammary tumor virus, which is an endogenous retrovirus. That means that it gets incorporated into the genome of the mouse and then gets transcribed by a reverse transcriptase, um, much like HIV. Now, in and of itself, this uh, virus does not make the mice necessarily sick, um, though it can promote uh, tumor growth 
um, in some mouse strains. And so, you know, actually in the human genome, about eight to 10% um, is start to, thought to be composed of endogenous retroviruses. And so they can exist in a steady state or under certain inflammatory conditions, uh, the uh, expression and transcription of the virus can be um, increased. And these, the mouse mammary tumor virus produces super antigen that can then activate and stimulate um, T cells in the immune system. And so this led us to ask these provocative questions, whether the enriched V betas we see are driven by super antigen and or whether or not they are involved in SKG arthritis development. And so here's just a table indicating some of the different uh, mouse mammary tumor virus proviruses that are incorporated into the genome and the specificity the super antigens have for some of the T different um, V beta TCRs that are all um, named uh, numerically. And so when we took a look uh, to confirm what we found in our transcriptomic data, looking at um, uh, by flow cytometry at the protein expression of these V betas, we found that the V betas that recognize mouse mammary virus tumor antigen, uh, excuse me, super antigen present in the BALPC mouse are uniquely uh, enriched in the GFP high SKG T cells in the naive population before arthritis development compared to all the other subgroups. And when we take a look at some of the candidate V betas that do not recognize uh, the mouse mammary tumor virus super antigen, we do not see this uh, same enrichment. So next we hypothesize that if the super antigen is involved in arthritis development, after arthritis development, we may actually see an enrichment of T cells uh, and the frequency of T cells bearing these particular V betas that respond to super antigen um, due to uh, polyclonal activation. And so we induced arthritis in our SKG mouse. And after they developed a moderately high disease score, we harvested both their joint and lymphoid tissue. And what we found is that T cells bearing V betas known to respond to super antigen, uh, their frequency is actually enriched in the arthritic joint compared to the peripheral lymph nodes. And when we took a look at candidate B betas that do not respond to super antigen um, in this mouse, uh, we did not see that enrichment at all. So then we asked, well, what is, what's happening with the expression of nerve 77 GFP protein uh, in these uh, T cells bearing these different V betas? And we found that the T cells that bear the V betas uh, that respond to super antigen um, in the joint have significantly higher expression of nerve 77 GFP compared to the T cells bearing these control V betas. So what does that mean? For us, we interpret it to mean that these T cells are actually responding to intraarticular antigen then because they have higher levels of nerve 77 GFP. And that antigen could very well be super antigen. And so to summarize, we found that through RNA sequencing, we were able to map this activated TCR signaling program and pathogenic naive SKG, D, SKG T cells before arthritis onset. We also found that there was an altered tolerogenic program, which um, I didn't show you today, before arthritis onset, really priming these cells um, uh, to potentially enter an immune response. And so these SKG naive T cells have a skewed TCRV beta repertoire likely pruned by endogenous viral super antigens and further enriched in arthritic joints. And so our future and ongoing work is focused on determining the arthritogenicity of these T cells with V betas known to respond to endogenous mouse uh, mammary tumor virus super antigen. And this really does have relevant implications in human autoimmune disease where endogenous or foreign antigens can prime uh, otherwise dormant autoreactive T cells and trigger disease. In fact, T cells bearing particular V betas have been reported to be expanded and retained in the RA synovial microenvironment. And with that, I wanted to acknowledge members of my lab, in particular, Stephen Yu and Noah per Perlmutter, two technicians that have contributed um, to much of this later work that I showed you. I want to acknowledge and thank my mentor, um, Arthur Weiss, for all his support along the way, as well as um, prior individuals that have um, worked on this project in his lab. And um, many of my collaborators at UCSF, in particular, Julie Zickerman for her mentorship 
Jimmy Yi for his mentorship and training in bioinformatics analysis, Elizabeth McCarthy, Joseph Derisi for his assistance with um, sequencing at the Biohub, and Justin Equim, who I'm working together with on developing um, uh, engineered T cells to really get at some of these questions. Um, and I want to thank our funding sources and in particular, a shout out to UCSF Premier P30 grant um, to help us really drive this understanding of um, precision medicine and rheumatology. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Judy. It's terrific and very, very, very interesting cutting edge stuff. Uh, Jimmy, you were on. All right, can everybody see this? Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the invitation to speak at Grand Rounds. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the methods that we've been developing over the past few years around single cell and spatial genomics um, and show a few applications of, of those approaches in studying human immune response and, and particularly in autoimmunity. Here are my disclosures. Let's see. All right, great. So I'd like to start with this slide that I, I show a lot of my first year graduate students uh, sort of to try to convince them that they should be least aware of single cell sequencing, if not sort of pursue aspects of single cell sequencing for their graduate school um, thesis projects. And so, you know, this is reminiscent of what happened with genome sequencing, where we have on the x-axis time, not on the y-axis, the number of cells that's been sequenced by the community. And as you can see on the y-axis is, is actually a, a logarithmic axis, which means that there's been this increasing exponential growth in the throughput of single cell genomics. And whenever you see something like this, it's almost always driven by technological advances. And I just sort of highlighted three different technologies that emerged over the past 12 years or so that really allowed the, the, the field to continue to sort of you know, increase throughput by order of magnitude and every few years. Of course, you know, started when I was a postdoc at the Broad, labs were still doing individual cell picking and then prepare bulk RNA sequencing libraries from single cells. And then a local company, Fluidine, came out with these micro wells and microfluidic devices that allowed us to process hundreds of cells simultaneously. And then another local company called 10X Genomics really popularized this approach to use microfluidic encapsulation of individual cells at very high throughput um, to enable processing of thousands to tens of thousands of single cells in a single experiment. And so my story is going to start with the 10X based approach. And so this is what um, it looks like, at least my cartoon representation of it. What you do is you take a vial of cells or nuclei and you encapsulate those cells or nuclei in microfluidic droplets. And each of those droplets will be labeled by a DNA barcode, which I've indicated here as a sort of QR looking by barcode that, that's the circumference of each um, uh, droplet here. And uh, what you get out when you run a single cell sequencing experiment is a giant matrix. And that matrix has the number of rows equal to the number of cells that we're sequencing. And usually per experiment, it's about 5,000 to 10,000. And the number of features is the number of molecular features that we're measuring. So if we're doing single cell RNA sequencing, then there's about 30,000 genes in the genome. And so this is a matrix of 5,000 rows by 30,000 uh, genes. And so we're not particularly good as humans in visualizing 30,000 dimensional data. And Judy has shown very nicely how there's a number of methods for projecting that 30,000 dimensional space down to two dimensions where each dot represents a single cell and cells that are phenotypically related to each other in 30,000 dimensional space are also closer to each other in two dimensional space. Um, and so this may be quite abstract, so I thought it might be useful is to just walk you guys through a little bit of ac actually how this works. So this is actually a video taken from um, the 10X device. And what you can see is that there is uh, a number, a, a reservoir of these hydrogels. These are squishy beads that can be pushed through a microfluidic device. In this particular channel here, this first channel is where cells are gonna be deposited. You can't really see them because they're too small. Um, and then the second channel is where oil is deposited. And where oil meets water, you create an emulsion, just like mayonnaise. And that emulsion will encapsulate a DNA labeled hydrogel bead, as well as single cells. In some cases, there are gonna be a lot of empty droplets as well. And we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so that's the, the, the hardware. What about the software? So I mentioned earlier that it's really hard to sort of think about 30,000 dimensional data. 
And um, what has really helped the community is borrowing a number of algorithms, developed in machine learning and computer vision uh, to try to visualize at least qualitatively uh, what data we're looking at. And so this is what I'm gonna show is an animation of real data. This is sequencing about 30,000 single cells extracted from peripheral blood. And you can see that in that first projection, there was only a ball, right? So if we just randomly take 30,000 dimensional data, try to represent it in two dimensions, there'll be no information. But by learning about the various relationships between cells in 30,000 dimensional space, we can sort of make this um, in, you know, better projection as we run the algorithms. And you can see that cells that are phenotypically related to each other, here colored by markers that we already know would tag a particular cell type, are in fact closer to each other um, in space. So structure will be revealed uh, when we run one of these algorithms. So that's single cell RNA sequencing. And certainly this has you know, taken over a lot of basic biology um, and many labs are running this, which is one of the reasons that 10X is a $15 billion business. The other reason they're a $15 billion business is because they have a great business model. I call this the PlayStation model. They sell you an instrument that's really cheap and then they charge a lot of money for running um, each of these cartridges. So you keep paying for the games. And so per sample, it's anywhere from $1,500 per $3,000. Um, and so that's really expensive to run one of these experiments. And this becomes particularly problematic when we start thinking about studying complex diseases like lupus, um, which is an autoimmune disease that my lab is particularly interested in. And that's because when, it, when you have a heterogeneous disease like lupus, or when you're trying to understand subtle effects like the effects of genetic variants on gene expression, you're gonna need large population cohorts for us to have enough statistical power to make inferences. Um, and so how do we think about doing single cell sequencing on large population cohorts? And so in 2018, my lab sort of came up with this idea, um, actually on a drive from Mission Bay to Parnassus, where we thought, you know, is there enough genetic information that's contained within the genome or the transcriptome of a single cell that will allow us to, you know, sort of decompose or deconvolute in a mixture of cells, which cell came from which individual? Okay, so it's a very simple idea that turns out to work. And so what we now do in our lab um, is we mix cells from genetically different individuals prior to loading them into a 10X instrument. And by mixing cells together, we can in fact increase the number of cells that we push through the instrument uh, so that we actually get a higher throughput. Now, normally 10X won't allow you to do this because as you increase the number of cells that you push through, you're gonna encapsulate in many cases multiple cells. You no longer get single cell sequencing. But because we have cells from different individuals, it turns out the math works out this way, that whenever you get multiple encapsulations, it's very, very likely that it's coming from the cells from two different individuals. So we wrote a piece of algorithm called demuxlet that given some reference genotyping, you can actually take the transcriptome of an individual cell and identify the individual that um, contributed that cell and identify cases where you have two cells from different people simultaneously encapsulated. So um, this reduces the, the cost of these experiments by about five-fold. So now we can sequence 5,000 cells per sample at about $600 a pop, which is roughly in the same ballpark as doing bulk RNA sequencing. And what's really nice is that sample information is automatically encoded. We showed in our original Nature Biotech paper that this approach is highly accurate and very simple to do. It's also applicable to a number of single cell sequencing assays, not just RNA sequencing, but ATAC-seq, nuclei-seq, or multimodal profiling. And for downstream statistical analysis, it's actually pretty important because this approach allows us to do um, really great randomization of our experiments, which will minimize batch effects. Okay, so does it work? Um, uh, and, you know, so I'm going to show you some data and our, and what we've been using MuxSeq for in my lab. Um, but just to sort of go back to this throughput um, uh, diagram I showed earlier, MuxSeq basically has allowed us to continue to increase the throughput of a single cell sequencing in the community. Um, and per sample, it's roughly now 10 to 20,000 cells that we can get out. And there are a number of papers that are now either in press or just came out recently. Um, that has now obtained millions of cells from large population cohorts. And, and these experiments were all done using this multiplexing approach. So here's our contribution um, to that field of work. And so we've been um, doing this experiment for about three years now where we are essentially using multiplex single cell sequencing to profile the circulating immune cells uh, from patients with lupus. So we have a cohort of 165 lupus patients, 99 controls, 
Um, the cohort consists of both um, patients of East Asian as well as European ancestry. And because the disease affect, uh, affect mostly biological females, the cohort skews female. In total, we sequenced 1.2 million cells or 5,000 cells per donor roughly. And this is by far the largest collection of single cells ever collected in humans. Um, and you know, not just in terms of the number of cells, but also in terms of the number of samples. Uh, single cell sequencing technologies changed really quickly in the process of generating this data over the course of three years. We originally started with just generating RNA sequencing data. Now we can get RNA sequencing data measuring the transcriptome as well as surface protein expression by using um, DNA tagged antibodies, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit, uh, so that we can now get two pieces of information um, in each cell. And so here's what 1.2 million cells look like um, in a sort of this two dimensional representation. Again, each dot is a cell and cells that are phenotypically related to each other are closer to each other. Now, for us to study a complex disease like lupus, um, where we expect subtle changes, um, we wanted to make sure first that there's actually quantitative information in the single cell sequencing experiment. And, and so, and, and the motivation for this is, is, is the following figure. As you can see, if we just take cells from control samples versus cells that uh, from patient samples, it's not like there's a brand new population of cells that's emerging. It seems like the compositional, um, the composition of PBMCs are just shifting so that um, the cases, for example, have a higher frequency of a specific type of CDA positive T cells. So how do we know that these shifts are real? Well, so we did this following um, sort of control experiment. What we did is we actually taken some of these cells and started grouping them together. So there are four populations of innate immune cells, classical monocytes, non-classical monocytes, conventional dendritic cells, and plasma citrate dendritic cells. We're gonna label these cells as myeloid cells. And then there's six different populations of adaptive immune cells, so natural killer cells, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, B cells, plasma blasts, um, and some proliferating lymphocytes, and we're going to call them um, lymphoid or, or lymphocytes. Now, the reason we sort of are taking a step back here is because the absolute abundance of lymphocytes and monocytes are in fact reported in the electronic health records of the same samples that went into the single cell sequencing experiment. So we can do a direct comparison of a quantitative measure that's recorded at EHR for these patients at UCSF using a totally different method to our single cell sequencing. And so I'll remind you again what we're doing with single cell sequencing. We're taking frozen blood, usually months after the initial collection, thawing them, mixing them together, sequencing, genotyping the individuals, running this algorithm to demultiplex cluster cells, and then aggregate all of that data together. So a lot of steps. And so we were really, really encouraged when we saw that there's great correlation between what's reported um, in the EHR on the y-axis here and what we estimated from the single cell sequencing data. So the joke here is that we have a really, really expensive complete blood count, right? Because each of these experiments is something like $600. And what's, you know, also as a, as, as a sanity check is that we know lupus patients have a um, depletion of circulating lymphocytes. So we can indeed see lymphopenia that the patients have lower frequency of lymphocytes and a concomitant increase in the frequency of monocytes. But what's really powerful about single cell sequencing is we can go beyond just these broad classifications of adaptive versus innate immune cells. And if in fact, we subtype all our cells into nine different populations, what we can observe, or I think this is 11, is that the lupus patients have a loss of circulating CD4 T cells. And in fact, we, if we subtype these cells even more, they have a selective loss of naive CD4 T cells um, in the blood. And so that's an interesting result. And in fact, if you compare patients of different ancestries, for most of these cell types, you know, the frequency changes between cases and controls are very similar, except for the CD4 T cells, where patients with East, of East Asian ancestry appear to have an even more significant depletion of circulating naive CD4s. And this is not due to uh, treatment. So we actually have some patients who have not been treated with any immunosuppressants or steroids for three to six months. And they also observe, they also sort of present this depletion of CD4s in circulation. Um, so that's changes in composition. But what we can do with single cell sequencing is we can go beyond just looking at, um, you know, cell counting of different cell types, but asking whether or not there are changes in the state of particular cell populations. 
And this is particularly interesting for lupus because there's this known feature about lupus patients. This doesn't occur in every patient, but about 50% of lupus patients will have an um, activation of antiviral genes uh, or type 1 interferon stimulated genes uh, in, in all of their PBMCs. And so we actually see this. Um, so red here are the cases and green are the controls. And we've now analyzed our data as though we've done a bulk RNA sequencing experiment. We aggregated all of the cells together. And you can see that there are these two clusters of genes. And um, for the aficionados in the audience, these are indeed the type 1 interferon stimulated genes that are highly expressed in about 50% of the lupus patients. So this validated what's known, but what's nice about single RNA sequencing is we can actually identify the particular cell types that's pre presenting these signatures and um, observe that there were two different clusters of genes. That first cluster of genes were highly expressed in every cell type in circulation, but that second cluster of these blue genes appeared to be very specific to the myeloid cells, the classical and non-classical monocytes. And so this type of information is, is uniquely obtainable from doing single RNA sequencing in an unbiased way. Something else we can do is we can now take our compositional data, so this depletion of naive CD4s in circulation, and start correlating it with our uh, changes in cell state. So this activation of innate immune um, or antiviral genes in myeloid cells. And when we did that exercise, so x-axis shows the degree of activation of um, ISGs in monocytes, and y-axis is the frequency or the abundance of, of naive CD4s in circulation. Um, what we saw is that those two traits are in fact inversely correlated with each other. So the more activated your monocytes are, the fewer CD4s you have. And we think that this is actually consistent with the pleiotropic effects of type 1 interferons in circulation. But this particular result has not really been described before in lupus because most cohorts are not collecting simultaneously compositional information and information about cell states for specific cell types in circulation in one study. So we've made this data all public, um, even before publication. It's, this is really important to us. So this is hosted on the cell, gene, cell by gene um, a portal that's, that's uh, developed by the Chang Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and this is by far the largest data it's set in there right now. And so if you want to play with the data or look up your favorite gene, uh, feel free to, to hit this link. So with the rest of the time, I just want to give you two quick hit vignettes about what's next in terms of technology. Um, and so what I've described so far is a lot of um, the scaling that's happening right now is based on sort of genetic multiplexing and other ways of multiplexing samples. But there is another approach to continue to increase the throughput for single cell genomics using an approach called combinatorial indexing. And we think that this is going to be transformative and, and enable some new experiments. So how does this uh, work? Um, and so we're going to talk about combinatorial indexing first using um, DNA labeled antibodies for a second. Um, one of the really nice things about using DNA um, as a labeling molecule is that we could label as many modalities as we want. And this has already transformed um, in many ways immunology. You know, fluorescence, for example, using a color marker to label antibodies has been around since 1960, and we can still only label four to 16 surface markers at one time. Gary Nolan and others described Cytop, which was revolutionary at the time in 2009, where you, you conjugate heavy metals onto antibodies and you can access 50 cell surface markers as, at the same time. Now, but if you attach DNA molecules onto antibodies, you can sort of tag as many antibodies as you have. Um, and already since the description of the initial approach in 2017, we can tag up to 300 surface markers in one experiment. And so in a short five years, we've totally uh, transformed the throughput by which we could uh, monitor um, sort of the behavior of, of, of the surface proteins of cells. Um, and so that's, you know, the number of features we can measure is, is great when we use DNA as a label, but the throughput in terms of the number of cells we can actually profile was still pretty low. Um, and the standard 10X experiment I mentioned earlier is about 5,000 cells per reaction. If you do sample multiplexing, like what I described earlier, we can get throughput increase about fivefold. But what we've now done is increase the throughput by about 50 fold by making every single droplet that's produced in that instrument be productive where we stuff cells in it. And that means that sometimes we'll get many cells in there, not a single cell, but two cells, three cells, four cells, or five cells. And if we can get 250,000 cells in a reaction, this is now approaching the throughput of FACTS and CYTOP. Um, so in the interest of time, I think I'm not gonna describe exactly how it works. I'm just gonna show you some data. So um, 
here's some data where we've actually now done a 60 plex experiment and 165 plex experiment measuring 60 surface proteins or 165 surface proteins and sequencing almost 200,000 cells out of a single channel of that microfluidic device. Usually the recommended amount again is about 5,000. And we can show that the data is very quantitative. We use the same 10 donors in these two experiments and we can compare the compositional estimates from these two experiments as well as the surface protein expression in each specific cell type and again, all of these appear to be pretty well correlated. So what's this used for? Why, why am I building this thing? Well, um, what we're really excited about, and this is again, one of the benefits of using DNA as a barcoding scheme is doing forward genetics. Because in addition to using DNA to read out molecular features, we can also use DNA to encode perturbations. And one type of perturbation we can encode are CRISPR-Cas9 perturbations. So in collaboration with Alex Marson's lab, we recently described the paper published in Science, ways to use CRISPR-A to turn on genes in primary human CD4 T cells. And so in the experiment that we're now doing in my lab, we can, um, we're essentially trying to turn on and turn off using CRISPR-Cas9 every single gene in the human genome and observe the consequences of those genetic perturbations on the surface protein expression of 300 surface proteins. Okay, so we can now ask, what are the genes that's actually controlling the expression of PD-1 or LAC3 or TIM or other surface molecules that are particularly important for T-cell function? Just as a preliminary set of data, um, this is actually an experiment where we did a CRISPR-A experiment and a CRISPR-N experiment to either turn on or turn off um, a panel of about 30 surface markers. We were a little bit worried that, you know, by doing CRISPR, but measuring surface protein expression, does the half-life of protein somehow is a little bit too long for us to see the perturbations? Um, the answer is, it actually looks pretty good. So along the diagonal, you can see that if we use a guide RNA that elevates expression of CD2, we can actually see CD2 surface protein being expressed. Um, and then if we use a guide RNA that gets rid of CD38, for example, we can see a decreasing CD38 surface protein expression. So again, a diagonal. The CRISPR-N is not as clean as CRISPR-A, but I think for pilot data, this is really great. And so we're now pushing this forward and um, are constructing the very first genome microterpseq experiment in primary human T cells. Um, and so the other thing we could use do with combinatorial indexing just really quickly is that we could encode also spatial information into um, you know, some of these single cell sequencing experiments. Um, and the way we do this is we actually make these physical wells about 500 microns in diameter and we can digest tissue over these physical wells and doing two rounds of combinatorial indexing, get single cell data, but also encode in space where each single cell comes from. And so here's what some of that data looks like. This is a new piece of technology that we're calling XYZ. We've now taken the liver slice um, and here's the H and E for that liver slice. So the light stain uh, stains for liver cells and the dark region stains for a tumor that we've put into the liver. And we take now a slice of the liver and uh, run our assay on it. And so what you get is you can get bona fide single cell sequencing data. Um, again, this is a 2D representation of that data. These red dots are the hepatocytes, the liver cells, and the yellow dots are the uh, MC38 tumor. But what's nice about this approach is that we can take each of these population cells and ask where are they located in two dimensional space. Um, and as a positive control, the red dots, the hepatocytes are overlapping with that light stain. And then the tumor cells are overlapping with that dark stain. So what can we do with this? So here's an interesting example of looking at a population or two populations of innate immune cells that are actually close, related to each other in terms of their function. And that's why they're close to each other in this two dimensional space, this orange population and this green population. But now if you look at their spatial distribution, they're really different. That green population of cells co-localizes with the tumor and that orange population of cells co-localizes with the liver. And it turns out this makes a lot of sense the green population are tumor infiltrating macrophages and that uh, orange population are liver resident um, in the immune cells uh, called Klufer cells. So we think this is a really exciting technology to now look at the co-localization of the cells, but also start asking questions about how co-localized cells might be controlling their gene expression programs in a coordinated way. So just to summarize, um, so I think this is a really exciting time in single cell and spatial genomics in terms of both technology development, but also the applications of those technologies to ask brand new questions. I first show MuxSeq, so using sample multiplexing to power population scale single cell sequencing. 
we, I think this is an unprecedented opportunity to both capture variation in composition as well as cell states. And we show lupus as an, as an example. And I show two examples of new emerging technology. CytoSeq will allow us to do these four genetic screens at much higher throughput than before. Um, and XYZ, I think, is a really exciting technology to start studying coordinated um, changes in cell composition and cell state. And for XYZ in particular, we're actually creating a new company called Survey Genomics that's going to be incubating at Baker Labs. Um, and we're closing our first round of seed funding. So this is hopefully going to be an exciting piece of technology that we deliver to um, a lot of end users. So I'll just leave my acknowledgments up. Obviously can't do any of this without my trainees, collaborators, and, and funding sources, um, and happy to take some questions. Great, thank you, Jimmy. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, so let's bring Judy back on. And about 10 minutes for questions, so please put them in. Let me start with a couple. So Judy, you mentioned that you have these arthrogenic T cells, but they need to be activated by some hit outside in, in the environment, and I think you mentioned the microbiome. So what, what is the relevance of that for what you're learning about why people do develop, uh, one person develops an autoimmune disease and someone else doesn't? Yeah, it's something that we all, um, as immunologists, are still struggling with and trying to figure out. So we see in a lot of our autoimmune diseases that there's this genetic predisposition um, but then there's uh, a lot of either environmental or genetic factors that contribute whether or not someone gets disease. And we don't understand all um, the factors. But in rheumatoid arthritis, we know that um, it can run in families and that um, certain environmental fa factors may really trigger disease, such as smoking uh, has been linked with rheumatoid arthritis in someone who's predisposed. So uh, we see something similar in the SKG model, which just um, makes it a very interesting model to, dis to study the pre-disease state, uh, which you often don't get to do in the animal models. And I'm going to ask Jimmy the same question. For those of us that are, spend more of our time in, in clinical work, as, as I know you do as well, uh, what's a home run for you? Like five years from now, your your work has been, you, all, all of the things have gone right, and you have learned something that does lead to a major change in the way we diagnose, treat, prognosticate these, uh, let's say, patients with RA? What, what would that look like? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the prediction problem is going to be hard um, for every, all the reasons that we've been discussing. But I think there are opportunities, right, to now do these in vitro experiments that we could start potentially um, interrogate many more sort of therapeutic modalities simultaneously, whether or not it's engineering new proteins or potentially new small molecules. I think we should, like, you know, start thinking about ways to screen using these single cell sequencing approaches, um, new um, sort of drug modalities that could potentially, at least for rare diseases or, you know, Mendelian forms of these rheumatic diseases uh, could create sort of new opportunities for treatment for, for patients that could potentially also expand to, to the complex phenotypes as well. Okay. Judy, same question, sort of if, if things went incredibly well five to 10 years from now, there's some home run from what you're doing that's pretty foundational to, to the bedside. What would that look like? One of the things that we're really focused on is understanding why um, tolerance is broken. So we know that in, in most of us, there are some self-reactive T cells that escape into the periphery. And so um, what trigger, not just what triggers them to become activated, but how does our immune system fail to, um, or, or breaks through our multiple layers of peripheral tolerance. And so what we're seeing is that strength of, you know, there's multiple factors and we don't, we have an incomplete understanding of it, but the strength of TCR signaling is really important. And in fact, even in human disease, we can see this where immunodeficient patients who have impaired um, signaling strength in their immune cells, um, they're lymphopenic, and they also develop autoimmune disease. And so uh, I think trying to understand how this chronic endogenous antigen encounter in the periphery, as well as impairment and induction of tolerance leads to uh, pathogenic disease. And so understanding the pathway that we could target uh, for new therapies uh, would be our ultimate goal. Great. And then maybe stick with you for a second. Uh, if an arthritogenic T cell is it arthrogenic in its in its essence, 
or is it something that then there's something about the cartilage that attracts it as opposed to the bowel or the vessels or some other thing where a autoimmune attack theoretically could take place as well? I'm smiling because that's exactly what we need to figure out. Um, why do these T cells hone to the joints? And, um, and in rheumatoid arthritis in particular, Art Weiss often talks about this, why to certain particular joints. So there is a, a pattern of phenotype, you know, the um, inflammation happens in the metacarpal joints and the proximal interphalanges, but not in the distal um, IP joints. And why is that? So uh, does it have to do with homing factors? I think that plays a, a large role into it. Or um, does it have to do with any resident cells in the uh, synoviocytes um, in those locations? So that's something that I think, especially with the technology Jimmy was sharing today, um, would be a really exciting way to take a look at this and try to understand the different patterns and phenotypes of um, the infiltrating cells as well as the resident cells in normal tissue. Great. Jimmy, anything you want to add to that? Oh, I think that's, yeah. That, I'm looking forward to those collaborations, Judy. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, you described, it seems like from the 10X, a lot of the advances have been computational, have sort of taken what sounds like the same piece of hardware and just become smarter about, about sort of uh, hacking it so that you can get more data out of it at the same cost. Um, is that the future or is the future somehow the hardware has to get upgraded as well in order to make more than incremental advances? And maybe that's what your company is about. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, yeah, some hardware upgrades are, are coming. Um, but I think the, the major challenge, I mean, the molecular biology needs to get better. But the hardest thing, especially when we start act, think about accessing disease tissue, it's the, the stuff that was hard 20 years ago. So we're like, how do you do tiso, tissue dissociation? How do you actually keep cells happy? How do you prevent nuclei from sticking together? Um, and I know Tenex is investing a lot in that, but, but we sort of see that, especially when we start thinking about tissue immunity, circulating immune cells are really easy to, to, to sort of profile, but tissue resident cells are much harder. Um, and so that's going to be a, a, a sort of, I see a major limit. And maybe there will be some innovations in that space where we could divide you know, come up with a device that would just allow us to dissociate all sorts of different tissue. That hasn't happened yet, but I certainly would be very excited about that. Okay. And then the, the, the spatial resolution piece uh, was, you know, incredibly cool, but trying to think, so what would the clinical application of that be? It, that to know that, I mean, you sort of know at a macro level that the tumor is here and the rest of normal cells are here. Can you envision a world where the surgeon using whatever technique one uses to cut out something is actually using some molecular profiling to know that they've gotten the margins of a tumor? Or how do you see that playing out in a way that's clinically applicable? Yeah, so we, we sort of, you know, I think a lot of the spatial technologies are showing sort of pretty pictures and we can show that too. But the, the real point for us at least is to try to understand how cells communicate with each other. Um, whether or not that's clinically actionable, I'm not so sure, but certainly from a basic science perspective, so much of what happens in disease pathology is how cells communicate. And very often it's through sort of like cell surface receptor versus ligand um, interactions. That's what we really want to understand. And we think by collecting thousands of neighborhoods of cells and each neighborhood has a different composition, we can start comparing those neighborhoods and figure out what makes two cells come together in certain neighborhoods and not others. Okay. So that's what we're really excited about. And then maybe maybe this is probably the last question. Just connect the dots for us. So the, the 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 work you're doing with Alex's group, and the sort of the uh, addition of CRISPR, and in, in some ways it sounds like perturbing the environment uh, for each of these cells, and then seeing what happens to them. Again, spool that out, and 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 how if everything goes great five or ten years from now, how could that be clinically relevant to a patient? Yeah. So. Um, one of the right challenges of sort of like human populations is that we, our effective population size is, is really small. And so, yes, we've studied lots of different patients. We, for complex disease, we can identify genetic variants that change our risk by very little. I think the opportunity is going to be able to truly do personalized medicine where somebody walks in, we sequence their exomes and genomes, and we can have a very good prediction of what's going to happen. But to do that, we can't sequence more people. We have to kind of like model that in vitro because it's much more effective to introduce all the genetic variants in a homogeneous background and do as many of them as possible 
That was not possible before CRISPR-Cas9, but now with CRISPR-Cas9, we can sort of like introduce all these variants in a way where you would just never see them if you actually sequence, even if you sequence the entire world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the dream is that we could take anybody who comes into the clinic, sequence their exomes and make really you know, good predictions about you know, what, what's gonna happen to them. Starting initially again with these like rare diseases, people who are clearly got some you know, large effect Mendelian-like or somatic mutation, but then eventually also you know, tackling common diseases. And then tackling is, it sounds like sort of the, the, the first path is figure out that, that, that when we perturb or, add, or find this particular gene, it increases your risk of developing lupus or whatever. And is then the next 10 years and then we fix that and you don't get lupus? Uh, I don't know. That would be, that'd be great. <laughs> I think okay, that, good. just want to see well. what, what, what the sort of aspirational goal here is. At that the would end. be aspirational. Yes. That would be aspirational. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, you never know. And if anybody's going to do it, I think the two of you together are probably as, as, as likely as anyone in the world. So thank you so much. It was really fascinating and interesting to see this part of the world. For those of us that are not basic scientists, not computational biologists, it's nice to hear it explained in ways that are accessible and, uh, and see how incredibly exciting it is. So really, really do appreciate it. We will see you back here again next week for Grand Rounds. Thanks so much.